Our next presentation uh, is going to be by uh, Dr. Steve Farley. Uh, Steve is Assistant Professor of Surgery in our Division of Vascular Surgery at UCLA, and he will uh, talk about uh, access for endovascular interventions, evaluations, and alternatives. I'd like to thank Dr. Kenyatta for inviting me to help with this talk today. Um, I wanted to do a quick story to dovetail Dr. Liu and uh, Dr. Jimenez's talks. Uh, I remember being a first year attending when Wes was a fellow and we had a ruptured aneurysm and we looked eyeball to eyeball with our anesthesiologist to not intubate the patient. We went to wash our hands and came back to an intubated patient getting chest compressions. So Wes and I were always very surprised by those results. You gotta be very clear, the next time I'll leave somebody in the OR while I wash my hands. All right, so my topic is access for endovascular interventions and this is evaluation and alternatives. So the goal of uh, access in my mind for uh, proceeding with endovascular repairs is to provide a safe and effective entry point into the vascular system to allow for the introduction and removal of endovascular devices. And I added removal because that's a lot of times where the problems occurs. You've gotten to the prize, you've, you've done the procedure, but then you can't get out of trouble. So again, safe entry and exit. The patients do not come with uh, danger signs. They do not tell us ahead of time that they're gonna be a, an access problem. And it's up for us to uh, carefully examine the CT scans to uh, look at the, the high risk features that your patients may have. And this is a, a little picture that I, I think is a good reminder. We can sometimes get to the goal, but we also gotta be able to get out. So the obstacles that we face in delivering uh, devices is that the patients sometimes come with small access vessels. Uh, they oftentimes can come with uh, co-committant uh, peripheral obstructive disease, so a plaque that gets in the way and it's hard to deliver devices. The arteries can be very tortuous. They can have had prior surgery in the groins or in the abdomen. There can be existing comorbid conditions such as obesity. And I think uh, this is a topic that's kind of come full circle as uh, we are doing more uh, increasingly complex endovascular interventions. Uh, the original phases of the endovascular era, these were large sheets with stiff devices and uh, iliac conduits were a, a common concept. I think as the iterations of the endovascular devices have improved for straightforward procedures, we now have lower profile devices, hydrophilic coatings, more flexible uh, delivery devices. And so this was a less important topic, but as we're doing more in more advanced endovascular work, we are now uh, having to run into these obstacles more often. This would be an example of a typical high-risk patient. You can see the amount of intra-abdominal and extra-abdominal fat. There's a very small aorta living in this patient. These are very small iliac vessels coming off of the bifurcation, and it's even difficult to see the externals. This is down at the femoral head by the groin. These are small common femorals and you can see the nice overlying penis. This is a high risk patient. This is somebody to be careful with. This is what you don't want to have at the end of your procedure is to be shooting a picture, seeing a blush of contrast at the external defined here. And now you have a bleeding emergency. So that's what we want to avoid. And this is from a classic paper of Iliac on a stick. This is when the large sheath has been coming, has been taken out. This is the cook sheath and a little fold in it. And that's the uh, iliac artery in a suscepted, and now you have a bleeding emergency. Dr. Lane went through uh, these concepts, but I'll reiterate uh, the existing sheath sizes that exist. So the most common products out there, I didn't include them all, but Medtronic is delivered through an 18 to 20 French. The Gore Excluder is also delivered through an 18 to 20 French. Cook is a little bit bigger from 18 to 22. Now we start moving into a thoracic world. We have larger diameter devices with larger access sheaths. So this is 18 to 24. And then I included for uh, some of the other group, the Edward Sapien uh, uh, Tavar device. This goes through a 14 to a 16. So these are relatively large sheaths, but again, we've got to remind ourselves how to do the conversion. The conversion from French to millimeters on CT is relatively easy. The French size roughly correlates with catheter circumference, which for us probably isn't that helpful because we're measuring diameters. So the outer sheath diameter is a third of the French size, so divide by three. A 12 French sheath is four millimeter diameter. 
A 24 French sheep is an eight millimeter diameter. That starts stretching some of our patients' common femorals. So axis choices, the standard workhorse is a common femoral uh, artery. This is a large caliber artery, generally speaking. It's compressible, it's been used for many, many years as an access site for endovascular approaches. And it has a relatively short distance to the aorta, so the infrarenal, the most common repair. You don't have to travel very far with your devices. The best way to evaluate this is like we do with everybody, physical examination, duplex ultrasound can be helpful, but I think really we're looking at our CT scans, identifying the risk factors that we talked about, diameters, calcification, tortuosity. The standard approach has been a common femoral artery cut down. This can be done by a transverse or vertical groin incision. And then after the procedure is performed, the hole in the artery is primarily closed. Uh, to discuss transverse versus vertical groin incisions, that's been a long-standing topic in vascular. I think the literature supports doing transverse incisions with lower morbidity, but a vertical groin incision can be used uh, for more flexibility. If you need to extend and do an endarterectomy, you need to get down on the SFA, think about doing a vertical incision. That moves us into the more modern era, so we're doing more and more percutaneous access to the common femoral artery. This is done in a pre-closed technique with the per-closed proglide system made by Abbott. Uh, the technique is to place a six French sheath and then two per-closed sutures are uh, placed in the artery at right angles. And this is done prior to dilation of the vessel to accommodate the, the device that's going in. At the end of the procedure then, the sutures that have been pre-placed are brought down and close the arteriotomy. There are relative contraindications to Proceeding with a percutaneous approach. Those would be calcification of the common femoral artery so that the per close doesn't fire and doesn't hold. A vessel diameter of less than five millimeters runs the risk of being closed shut by the per close. Obesity can be a challenge as sometimes the per close can't actually reach all the way down to the artery and can't get it to fire. And then a prior groin incision can be difficult because it can be difficult to pass the, uh, the knot down to the level of the artery. What are the data regarding percutaneous versus femoral cut down? This was a, a review of a, a database of 4,000 patients. This is a modern uh, series in the last couple of years. They identified of the 4,000 or so patients, about 1,000 of these were done percutaneously. The problem with this database is that it does present potentially a selection bias where high risk patients were offered cut down rather than percutaneous, but I think it goes to show that in a modern series, we're approaching at least a quarter or more of the patients are now undergoing a percutaneous approach. 4% 4 4 of the attempted uh, percutaneous uh, procedures were converted to a cut down, so there is a defined failure rate, but that is relatively low. And the conclusions of this paper is that uh, percutaneous access allowed for shorter times, fewer wound complications, and they also had the addition of a shorter hospital stay. Uh, to talk about uh, Access is to also talk about the alternatives when the common femoral is felt to be uh, high risk and is not felt to be an appropriate option, what exists? And so the classic discussion is that of an iliac artery conduit. And this involves a retroperitoneal exposure. Uh, on, and with that, then the uh, external or the common iliac artery are controlled and a 10 millimeter Dacron endocide graft is performed. In the original descriptions out of the Cleveland Clinic, this was offered as a potential uh, iliac to femoral artery bypass with the idea that the reason you were doing the conduit was for external iliac artery disease, and so they offered the patient to use the conduit at the end as a bypass graft to the groin. It can also be managed with just oversewing the end and leaving a, a stump of the uh, graft on the iliac. Um, Another option that uh, is, is discussed and that we've all tried and done at times is what's called the endoconduit. And this is, again, a patient who's been identified as having small access vessels, potentially with atherosclerotic disease, is to provide access at the, at the femoral and then aggressively dilate uh, calcified iliac disease with uh, large covered stents. That way you now have, in theory, control of any bleeding that may have come from the angioplasty, which then allows for the delivery of the larger sheath. So this is, uh, these are uh, the original articles discussing uh, iliac conduits from the Cleveland Clinic group. Uh, there's a lot of recognizable names that come with this. 
And so they showed the retroperitoneal incision here. We call it a transplant incision for a kidney incision. Other people call it a Gibson. And this can be uh, done rapidly and allow for access to the iliac arteries in five to 10 minutes. And these were the different configurations that were discussed, but basically it allows for delivery of these larger sheath devices um, bypassing common femoral and external iliac disease. This is a, uh, the idea of the endoconduit so that a, typically a Vibon stent graft is placed in the uh, artery ahead of time, aggressively dilated to eight to 12 millimeters. And then this allows for passage of the large sheath and the larger device later. Upper extremity access is also an important uh, armament a tool in the, in the toolbox to allow for uh, complex endovascular procedures. This can be done via cut down or by percutaneous techniques. Uh, it comes with uh, elevated complication rates in comparison to the lower extremity, but again, these can be well managed and the complication rates are low. But the things to be in, uh, concerned about are nerve injury with brachial sheath hematoma, stroke. These uh, sheaths and devices now are being passed from the arm into the arch past the vertebral, potentially past the carotid, and you can send embolic material into the brain, so stroke is a, defined, is a known complication. And then just limb ischemia. Uh, occasionally, uh, the sheaths that are put in are going to be occlusive, and you can get ischemia into the, uh, the upper arm and into the hand. I think to do a complex uh, aneurysm work from an upper extremity approach, uh, this should be evaluated by CT. Arch configuration can be critical to allow for safe delivery of devices. Patients with type three arches that have a very elongated course to get down to the uh, descending thoracic aorta can make for a very sigmoidal sheath and make pushability difficult and uh, really make a case much more complicated. So knowing your arch ahead of time is very useful. And it can also identify proximal subclavian uh, atherosclerotic disease. This is again uh, to remind you about arch anatomy a lot of the patients that are coming in are older patients that have these aneurysms, and they've gone on to elongate these uh, aortic arches. If you're coming from a left-sided approach, you now have to have a wire that comes down, back around, and reach down to the areas you're looking to treat. Um, actually, artery access is one option. This is uh, how we do it at UCLA. We do it with an infraclavicular incision. It's the same standard vascular approach that's been used for an axe-fem bypass. Below the clavicle, transverse incision is made. The pectoralis muscles are spread. Axillary artery is identified. We sew a 10 millimeter uh, Dacron conduit onto here. It can then be punctured separately with a sheath. You can puncture this multiple times with multiple sheaths and uh, have readily easy access to get down to the descending aorta. Upper extremity access has also been reported done uh, via brachial approach. This is a paper out of uh, UT Southwestern with Carlos Timron's group. They actually report two uh, techniques. This is their explanation of a cut down, so mid brachial isolation of the artery, and then they puncture it. Uh, his approach is a, is a 12 French sheath that he then passes multiple wires through, and through his 12 French sheath, he uh, cannulates one wire at a time with a separate seven French sheath and uh, does his, uh, his fenestrated work in, in this uh, aspect. He's also reported in this paper doing it by a percutaneous approach with a 12 French sheath in the brachial. I don't have the courage for that yet. But this is uh, his approach. He puts a large uh, axis sheath in the descending thoracic. This is a 12 or a 14 sheath. And then he puts his wires through. This is all done by a brachial cut down with a primary repair at the end. So, Access summary, preoperative evaluation for an entrance and an exit strategy is key. Elective exposure is ideal rather than emergent exposure. So we all get away with it sometimes, and uh, when we don't, then we have a problem. So think ahead, it's better to do everything electively controlled rather than suddenly have a bleeding emergency. Try to plan ahead, have plan B, but don't get yourself stuck in a bleeding emergency. Common femoral access is still the workhorse. Uh, cut down versus percutaneous, I think either is acceptable at this point. There's nothing wrong with the cut down. And the alternative access options are uh, increasingly common as we increase the complexity of endovascular approaches. Uh, upper extremity work can be done uh, 
through the brachial, through the axillary, we've actually had a couple of uh, thoracic stent grafts put through the subclavian by a conduit. Um, again, do it emergently, uh, electively, not emergently.